dismiss the kids camp. I was sitting here opening my Bible and wondering if the last ribbon was going to open up to Mark because uh, one thing I've been doing the last couple of weeks has been really immersing myself in the Bible and uh, I have like a personal devotion going, a personal Bible study going, I have one going with Natalie and so I didn't know if, which one this was going to open to. But it opened to Mark. So. So we are continuing our teaching series, and um, I actually I have both this and that going um, because I realized this morning that I think I'm going to need batteries for the wireless, and I thought they were double A's, and I found out it was a nine volt. So, won't walk. But um, anyway, excuse some of the mess up here. Um, we're starting to prepare for. Christmas and Chain of Lights. Um, we have a table up there for our nativity and we're going to start getting this stuff. If you are on Facebook and you watch, I, I do a weekly video for the church to kind of, uh, usually Thursday or Friday, I'll put out a like, what's going on type video. And uh, I had Christmas music playing in the background because I'm, I, I don't care right now. I need Christmas music. I like Christmas music. It's that time of the year. It's like like my dad used to say, Christmas is supposed to be in your heart all year round. So I was I had the Christmas music on. I can't bring myself to watch a, a Walmart channel movie though. Yeah. This is kinda, I don't know. Not not my cup of tea. I like the Grinch though. We saw the Grinch last week. But anyway, getting into our discussion. So we're in part three of our teaching series. We'll conclude next week. Um, until we come back, we're going to we're gonna do part four next week, and then we're going to go into our Christmas season series. But today's title, like I said in, in the bulletin, it's, it's all wrong. Um, today's verse is going to be um, chapter 10, verses 17 to 31, and the title is Self versus God. So before we begin, I'm just going to say, do you remember what it was like when you first accepted Christ? When you first decided to follow Jesus? Do you remember what your lifestyle was before and what you were walking away from? Do you remember those things that just might have taken you away from God that you decided... No, I want to be to church on Sunday. And so you stop doing things that you were doing on Sunday. And then maybe eventually you started doing, you know, taking away things that kept you from Bible study or, or whatever it was. Because you just wanted to immerse yourself in who Jesus was. Were there friends that maybe you knew weren't a good influence, that you knew you had to walk away from? As much as you love them and, and you wanted them to share that life, you knew that stuff that they were doing was going to take you down the pathway, continue on the pathway that you were just veering off from. Well, today we're going to see where Jesus comes to this rich young man and what this actually means for him. So we'll go right into verse 17. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your mother and father. And he said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept all from my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. 
and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowfully, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult is it to enter the kingdom of heaven? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus, looking at them, said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say, Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is one, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the land within the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. So there's a lot to unpack in this. But we're going to get through this. So going back to what I was saying, you know, how many people have you heard that when they accepted Christ, when they decided to follow Jesus, they, they left? I mean, there, there are the stories of the missionaries who leave everything behind, you know, wherever they're living to go to these third world countries. And yes, that is, that is partially what Jesus is talking about. But there are people who have had great jobs that have left them because they know that the jobs have questionable business practices. And they leave them and they go to uh, another company that it might not pay them as well, but they have this clear conscience of heart because they know that where they're at is doing something legally or, or beneficial or whatever that they know God is going to bless them in. This is what helped shape the church at the beginning. We'll get into it, but there were many who sold property, who sold lands to give to the church. The Bible tells us that for all of that, the people that were the church in the early day had nothing. But what makes that happen? What makes this, what made this man go away so sorrowfully? Now, let me, let me say this. The Bible is saying there is nothing wrong with being rich. All right? There are people that misquote the Bible all the time. You know, money is the root of all. No, it's not money is the root of all people. It's the love of money that is the root of all people. You know, it's, it's the Scrooge McDuck. How many remember Scrooge McDuck? And every time he saw a penny, he was, ah! And he had to pick it up. That is the type of person that the Bible is talking about. God uses people with riches in the church all the time. So it's not saying that money is the root of all evil, but rich people. It's, it's understanding that people have to understand that God is in control of that wealth. Some of the richest people that we've had in history were Christians. Some of the people like um, J.P. Morgan was one of those people who as much as people you know, know J.P. Morgan and investing and everything, but J.P. Morgan was a person who, he helped build churches and helped give to his church more, and helped missions and everything that was in his power. But we think because the world would have us think that, oh, J.P. Morgan, one of the richest men of his time, they want you to understand that, yeah, he might have been the richest man of his time, one of them, but he was a man who loved God, who understood 
what Jesus was trying to tell this rich young man and then turned around and used his riches for the glory of God. So let's jump into this. So the three thoughts, the first thought I have is it is possible to follow the rules and miss the heart of the matter. So the rich young man, he did all the right moves. That's what we see. He did all the right moves. One of the things he did when he goes up to Jesus, he calls him good teacher. Jesus has to rebut him. Because as we learn in the Bible, only God is good. This is what it says. Jesus looking at him, loved him, and said, you lack one thing. All right, this is, this is actually going back to the thing. Go and sell all you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Disheartened by the same, he went away sorrowfully, and he had great for he had great possession. Now it's understanding that what Jesus is saying here is you need to trust God all the way through. You need to trust God for everything that you're going to go through. It's understanding that God is in control of all the riches. You know, He can have His snap take away. We read the book of Job, and we see how Job had all these riches, everything. And God, in one snap, allowed the devil to take all that away from him. But Job had his great faith. He had his great trust in God. His wife was telling him, curse him, curse him. God died. He didn't. Because he knew God gives and God takes away. So Jesus is sitting here and he's challenging the young ruler to trust him. But we see, too, it says Jesus loved him. Jesus had this, this deep affection for him. We see at this point here, it says, and as he's setting out on his journey, so this is Jesus beginning his journey to Jerusalem. This is the beginning of the end now of, of the gospel of Mark. Because we're going, after we're done with verse 10, after we're done with chapter 10, we go into Passion. But he comes up, this man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. The Bible gives examples of why Jesus would challenge him to this. He wanted to make sure that this young man knew exactly that God was good. When we read 1 John, when we read uh, 1 John chapter 1, when we read the book of James, when we read Romans, we see this overarching thing that man thinks he's good. Man, we live in a day and age where people say, well, I'm a good person. God is teaching here. Jesus is teaching. No one is good. No one is good but God. You know, we, we all have this innate evil in us. That while we think we're doing good, while we might be doing good, to God, because God is holy and God is all good and no evil is in him, that God is the only one that is good. We discern from the whole of this exchange with Jesus that this young man was a go-getter. He was aggressive. It says, what does it say? It says, he ran right up, ran right up, sat down, knelt down. Good teacher. You know, we think of people today that, that companies, you know, they look for that certain person, as they say, to, to hire, to raise up. And that's what we call an achiever. And that's what this guy was, most likely. But at his heart, he was an exemplary good man. When Jesus is talking to him, it shows that he was listening to Jesus. He was dazzled with his brilliance and moral excellence. But again, like many in the world, he could not give up that one thing that he trusted more in than God. 
So we have to ask, how many people do we know that have said they appreciate our faith, but they don't understand why we have it? In other words, they don't understand why in a world today when the world sits there and wants us to go and do something, they invite us to all sorts of things. There was a mean picture on Facebook just last night I saw that uh, a friend shared, and it showed this group of people sitting in a football stadium with the snow coming down, they're covered in like one inch of snow, like this, watching the game on a Sunday. And it says, it's amazing that you can stand that, but you say you can't show up to church on Sunday. One asked. The world's practices have us questioning things. The world's practices have us at odds with one another. See, they haven't gotten to the point of why we are following Jesus, why we are following God's commands. And it goes back to why children, it says, will inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's because we have that childlike faith. We have that desire. We have that trust in who God the Father is. Childlike faith requires us to be totally dependent on our Heavenly Father for everything. Much like our children are dependent on us to provide for them. Next thing is, is it says, Jesus showed genuine love for this man. Even though he knew that this man was not going to follow him, he showed a genuine love for him. I mean, we look at this, and it says, Jesus, looking at him, loved him, and said, you lack one thing. So he's sitting there, and Jesus, Jesus, yes, Jesus is God. He's God the Son. Jesus is love. God is love. But Jesus is looking at this young man, who is sitting there saying, I've done all of this, and Jesus loves him, because he knows that this boy has a sincere desire to want to do the right thing. But that's the key. He wants to do it. The question is, will he do it? And Jesus challenges him. And then it says, disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And let's remember that God knows what's inside our hearts. He knows if we truly love him, or if we, we like him. You know, there's a difference. Remember when we were dating and there was the whole thing of, ah, do you love him? No, I, I don't like him. I wouldn't say I love him. And that's the, that's the thing that Jesus is going through here. He's, he knows. He loves this guy. He, he loves this young man. He knows the potential this young man has. But the question is, does the young man love him or like him? This is why many people we see, they come into church and they, they're here. They're giving it their all, their gusto for a time and season. They love to be here. They, they get to know people. But, you know, you, you start to see things that you like. I don't see them growing. I don't see them... You know, there's something not right, and then suddenly you see them, they start to fall away from the church. And all of a sudden, when they've been there uh, on, on Tuesday night or Wednesday night or whenever the church has the midweek Bible study or service or whatever they're doing, they, they fall away because all of a sudden, you know, oh, well, I got involved with a thing from work and we're, we're doing this. Or, you know, it, it's things that God puts that take not God, but Satan puts in the way of the people that make them fall away. Now I'm not saying you work, you know, if, if you have to work on, on a Tuesday night or Wednesday night, that you're providing your, for your family. Your family is your first ministry. And that's what God wants. But what I'm saying is if it's something that they don't really have to do, but it's a choice that they have to make. That's what God wants. He wants us to freely choose Him, freely serve Him, freely love Him. So that's what God does. He, he challenges us. 
But when we see people fall away, we have to question, did they really love God or did they like God? The next point is this. Full trust in God is what is required. Now, understand this. Um, when he's sitting there and he's saying, when Jesus is sitting there and he's talking and he's challenging this young man to sell all his possessions and follow him, he's telling him, put your faith in my Father. But let's go back and look at one thing. Jesus, when he's talking to the, to the disciples, when he's talking to them afterwards, and they're saying, well, this is impossible. He looks at them and says, with man it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Let me notice Peter, but we're going we're gonna to come back and visit that. See, here's the thing. Jesus goes through the Ten Commandments. Look at this. You know the commandments. This is Jesus now asking him, asking this young man, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. So Jesus is sitting there, and he first says, now I want you to see this whole picture. This is how it all comes together. This is it. Jesus is sitting there, and he's saying, sell all your possessions. Why should you follow me? And he's like, you know the commandments. But notice the commandments Jesus tells you. Notice the commandments he lists there. All right, those are ten command, part of the Ten Commandments, but it's not all the Ten Commandments. You see, this portion of the Ten Commandments are all that has to do with our dealings with our fellow men, our fellow human beings. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. But when we look at the full Ten Commandments, all right, the ones that Jesus mentions are on the right hand side. But look at the ones on the left hand side. These are the ones that Jesus doesn't mention. Shall have no other gods. Shall not make a carved a carved image <clears throat> and worship it. Shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. All right. So when Jesus is sitting there, and he's saying, see, Jesus knows. When Jesus is sitting there, and he's saying, do you do all these? And he's mentioning the ones on the right. He's purposely not mentioning the ones on the left. Why? Because he knows that this young man is not fully committed to God. The ones on, the, it used to be, it, it, there's this thing, if you look at the, what we call the greatest commandments, People come to Jesus and they say, Rabbi, what are the greatest commandments? And Jesus says to them, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And then the second one is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. He takes all ten of the commandments and wraps them up into two. The reason being is because the first four are for God and the last six or four are interactions with and so, in this whole thing, Jesus is sitting there, and he's saying, you say you love, you say you trust God. You're keeping all the ones lined up that you should with man. But he's not mentioning the ones with God. He already knows this young man's heart. He already knows that the rich young man trusts his wealth more than he trusts God. And radical trust in God is what makes giving up things possible. When Jesus uses the hyperbole of the camel going through the eye of the needle, this proverb is to show that many rely too much on what they can see and not see. It's a hyperbole to show faith. Because he follows it up with, with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. For us, we need to look at how it is. You know, are there examples? Now, we can go through the Bible. We should be going through the Bible to see examples. But how is it that 
people have done this? How is it that people have trusted? There was a man by the name of George Mueller. He was an evangelist and what they call a faith missionary. Now, Mueller lived in England. And he gave up a lot of his promising career as he followed God and had this heart for all of us. Now, at the time, if, if you want to know the time, if you ever watched Oliver Twist, you know, if you've ever read Oliver Twist or any of Dickens' books or seen any of Dickens, um, the movies based on Dickens' stories, you know that there was a time where society just had this, I don't know what to call it, uh, they, they fed on the orphans, they fed on, on the poor, they, they just, there was this preying on the poor, and the rich just got richer, and the poor struggled. You know, we all think of that scene, if you've ever watched the, the classic Oliver Twist movie, where he goes up with the poor drool, and he's like, sir, can I have some more? Because they were hungry. Well, George Mueller was this man, he saw that going on, and he read his Bible and knew that was not right. And so, he decided he was going to form his own orphanage. And so, he started these orphanages. He, now, at the time, they wouldn't keep the boys and girls together, so you had boys orphanages and you had girls orphanages. And it was unlikely that they would ever get an education, because the education at the time was for the rich. And so, what ended up happening was he decided, not only am I going to form these orphanages, but I'm going to train, I'm going to teach these young men and these young women and show them the love of Christ in such tangible ways. In his lifetime, he took care of 10,024 orphans and provided educational opportunities for the orphans to the point that he was accused by some of raising the poor above their natural station in British life. So there were people, in other words, there were people that didn't want to see the poor succeed. They didn't want to see these, these kids go on and have promising careers. He established 117 schools which offered Christian education to more than 120,000 children. Here's the thing. This was the verse that he was trusting in. As he went through life, people wondered how he was going to do all this with no money. And he called on this one verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your paths. We see this. Um, hold on. I think it got lost. I had a I had a thing here that showed this, but I wrote it here. By the time of Mueller's death. Primarily using the money for supporting the orphanages and distributions, they were able to give 285,407 Bibles, 1,459,506 New Testaments, and 244,351 other religious books. So, like if you go to a Christian bookstore, you see, like, you know, um, all in, or um, I don't want to say the Joel Steve book for obvious reasons, but you know, they're there. But you know, a, a book by um, John MacArthur or Ravi Zacharias, they gave those away because they wanted these kids to know what God was all about. And here's the other thing all these were translated in more than 20 other languages. The money was also used to support other faith missionaries around the world, including the famous Hudson Taylor here in America. 
And the work that Mueller began over 150 years ago still continues on to this day. But here's the one thing I want you to know. Mueller had such a trust and faith in God. He never decided to write a budget for the orphanages. And so he went to this one orphanage one day, and it was, there was no money in there. There was no food for the orphans. And so, as he went in there, he called them, let's, let's get ready as if we were going to have dinner. And they were like, well, what are the kids going to do? And he's like, we're just going to pray. We're going to pray. So they came into the dinner hall, and Mueller bowed his head and began to pray, began to thank God for all that he provides and would provide. And all of a sudden, there's a knock at the door. That knock at the door was this man who was bringing food to a place and the carriage wheel on his cart broke. He wasn't going to be able to get it there in time. Like by the time it would take to have this cart fixed, all the food would be spoiled. And so he said, is there a possibility you could use this? And in it was 20 gallons of milk. There was cheeses and meats all needing to be prepared. Mueller thanked God for providing. And they brought that food in and they prepared it. And those kids didn't go hungry for a few days until money came in and they were able to get back to where they were going. It goes back to this. Trust the Lord your God with all your heart and do not lean with your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he may make straight your paths. And we see examples of this. We see examples of this. This is what we read in the book of Acts, as we learn of the church growing. And again, this goes back with God not having a thing for people, uh, having money, but using the money for his purpose. This is what it says. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles, by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold the field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So he's sitting there and he knew, you know what, God's given me a lot. I'm going to take this one plot of land, I'm going to sell it, and I'm going to give it to the apostles to help the church in its need. When we read about Ananias and Sapphira, <clears throat> they, uh, Ananias and Sapphira were these two people in the book of Acts. They, they saw all the people doing this, saw all the people selling what they had. And what they ended up doing, what they ended up doing is they said, you know what, we're going we're gonna to keep a portion of the money back. But we're going to tell the apostle Peter that we're giving everything that we sold the land for. And so that's what they did. They, they turned around. But, of course, you came from the Holy Spirit. And that's what ended up happening. The Holy Spirit spoke to Peter and said, No, they're giving you a portion. And so Peter, when he confronts him, told him point blank, Listen, all you had to be honest with us and say, Listen, we sold them only and we're keeping this amount of money, but we're giving you this amount of money. That's all you had to say. You didn't have to fool the Holy Spirit. You didn't have to lie to God and us. Of course, the story is Ananias and Sapphira because Ananias lied and the Holy Spirit struck him down. And then because Sapphira, who Peter gave a chance to tell the truth, she backed her husband up. She had her life taken. But it's suffice it to say, God is not against riches. What he is against is when people do not trust him fully. This goes to our next point. <clears throat> the example is clear for the apostles. Now, let's remember the last couple of weeks that we've been going through both our teaching series and our, our um, previous series, the apostles keep 
open a mouth and start to fly, right? And everything that, that seems like they could say and do and learn, they screw it up. But this one time, they come before God and they're asking Him, and we see it right here. Down in verse 28, Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. And then Jesus agrees with it and says, Truly I say, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now and in this time houses, brothers, sisters, and mothers, and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and last first. So Jesus' point here, as he points out, is many will not have their reward here on earth, but they will once they get to heaven. <clears throat> now the key thing is this, this last point. The first will be last, the last will be first. This is, this is Jesus also, this is God turning society around. Because we look at the people that have so much as being the people up here, but God sees the people who have the stuff down here reversed. The people who struggle, he holds up. Because those are the people that need him most. Those are the people that are trusting in him most. <clears throat> now, say it for whatever you will, I'm not big on the pastor or CEO type, as you can tell. I'm not doing all the stuff that a lot of churches do. I'm not preaching fluff sermons. I'm not trying to bring people in here, get butts in the seats, as they say. But that's what CEO pastors do. They sit there and they do these things because they, they, they just start to fall in love with money. But here's the one thing I will point out. For all that there are for these pastors of mega churches, some get a bad rap. But there are things we can take from the good ones. Now, I give this example because there, you, have to, you have to understand why some people hold a one particular pastor in high regard and take other ones down a couple of notches because they see things. Like last week, me and Natalie were watching this report on a pastor in South Carolina who was building a $7.9 million mansion. And it was like over 17,000 square feet. And it was like, you know, the, the, the news reporters were asking, you know, is this necessary? They, they were investigating and it looked like, you know, all he was about was the money. But then you have some pastors that have big churches, but they live in modest homes. And it's because they're given all that money in the church. That money in the church is going to where it should be. So the one pastor that I want to bring up about this, and this is why I wanted to kind of prep him for because a lot of people hear the name and they're like, oh, really? But Rick Warren is one of those good pastors. And let me explain why. Rick Warren does not accept a paycheck from his church in South Park because he gets a lot of money from the books that he writes. He sits there and he realized at one time, why should I be taking like a double portion of money? So he asked them to take that money that he would be getting for a paycheck and put it back into the church. But he also did something else. Him and his wife agreed that with all the money they would ever get from the books, they would live on 10% of the income. Now think about that. What does the Bible say? The Bible says that tithing, if we tithe, we're supposed to tithe, give 10% of our income to God, and live off the 90. Well, he turned around and said, I'm going to live off the 10 and give the 90. Now you notice, people who are always bad enough and say, oh, look at the church, look at the, the fluff, look at all this. But I wanted to point that out because this is a man who, right now, he's, he's probably not as popular as he was, whether or not it's because people say about the fluff sermons or whatever. 
There are people that follow other pastors out there who there are some that are good, solid Bible teachers teaching the Word of God the way it should. But there's still many more out there who get their names up, who, you know, are giving their five-week sermon on the best marriage, you know, you can possibly have. Meanwhile, you find out their church is leading in divorce in the town and the state. But Rick Warren, for everything that is going on in his life, four years ago, his son Matthew committed suicide. He dealt with bipolar depression. And the one thing that Rick and his wife Kay decided was, we're going to start a foundation in our son's name that's going to help churches understand what goes on with mental illness. They started a conference. They started all sorts of things to help people get aware of that. Kay took money from one of her books, and 90% of those proceeds go into AIDS research in Africa. Now, I'm sure if the Warrens were here, they wouldn't want to be lifted up in that way. They, they, they don't want the accolades. They, they're sitting there saying, we want to just wait until we get to heaven and hear good and well done, good and faithful servant. But the reason why I bring that up is because this is how radical God calls us to be. He calls us to serve him with this love, with this unabandoned desire. And Jesus says that the first will be last and the last shall be first. That's an example. One thing we often forget is that here we're safe. But in other parts of the world, like we prayed about earlier, our brothers and sisters, they are meeting today in secret. There are people in Asian countries that are meeting in caves because they cannot be found out. There are people in Middle Eastern countries who just by having a Bible or even a Bible verse written down can be put to death. But they're willing to give up everything, including their lives, because they love and trust God. The world must understand that our values are going to be reversed if we follow God. God wants us to be willing to sit and break bread with people who we don't think he would. But the Bible shows us that Jesus ate with people who he was judged for. Jesus hung out with the last so that they would become first. See, at the heart, when we go back into when we go back into the verse, oh, there it was. In the heart, when we go back to the verse, the rich young man says, how can I get eternal life? With all his money, he was willing to pay for it, probably. With all his money, he wanted to buy eternal life. There's another story. I'm thinking down the road we're going to go through the book of Acts. It's, it's really awesome to see how the apostles, for all their screw-ups, how they ended up acting. But, and there's a story of Simon the magician. And Simon wants to buy the Holy Spirit. He sees everything that the apostles are doing. He's seeing them make the lame walk and the blind see. And, he wants to buy that. He thinks it's the greatest trick in the world. And it seems that he follows Christ at first, but then all of a sudden it shows that he didn't. He, he just wanted it for his own personal gain. And John and Peter sit there and they give him, they, they give him his business. They put him in his place. We don't want people to leave feeling down like the rich young man. But it's going to happen. See, the rich young man trusted his riches to buy him what he desired. 
And when he found out, when he was met with the harsh reality that it couldn't, he went away dejected, broken hearted. The truth is, he didn't have to pay that price. The truth is, he didn't have to pay for what Jesus was offering because Jesus was getting ready to pay that price. And God paid the price by sending Jesus to die on the cross for us. And that's something that as we get ready to have our little Thanksgiving meal, as we get ready to, to break bread as a family, as we get ready to break bread with our families this week on Thanksgiving, this Thursday, let's remember that that is one of the things we should ultimately always be thankful for. And we don't have to follow the rules as the young man did. The young man wanted those rules, but because Jesus said, I love you, because God knew that he wanted to spend eternity with us, he sent Jesus on the cross to die for us. And so let us be thankful for that today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father.